show you some more pictures uh, that show you, again, this idea of the rich complication of nature. But I want you to think, as I show these pictures, about what you get taught in your physics course. Because in some sense, what you get taught in your physics course must be very misleading. You get taught equations. You can be put on a few blackboards, or in fact, a small piece of a blackboard. And you get taught that things are basically, fundamentally simple. Maybe like this. This is an Escher drawing, so it's not quite as simple as all that. But here's a drawing of space as essentially repetitive, one thing after the other, just a simple repetition again and again of a basic object. But as we look at ourselves and our spouses and the weather and other things, uh, we don't quite see this level of simplicity. <laughs> Here is a baby lobster, in contrast. Now, a baby lobster has zillions of different parts. Each part has its own function. Each one is different. Each one is doing its thing. This, this living being was produced by exactly the same laws of physics that produces the relatively simple motion of the Earth around the sun. I'm not going to be able to talk about the full complexity that occurs in biological systems in life today. I'm going to be talking to some extent about a lower level of complexity in which you get objects repeated but somewhat different, somewhat changed either in size or in shape. So this is another Escher drawing which illustrates what I want to talk about. Here is the same object. Friendly fellow who we might want to give some names, like Oscar to, and here's Oscar written again and again and again and again. Each time turned around a little bit, each time a little bit different. In fact, this kind of uh, simplicity or complexity, it's intermediate, can be seen in the world. This is a picture of a blackwater fern, familiar for many trips to the woods in the springtime. However, this fern has never seen the woods. This fern was produced on the computers of a bunch of people at uh, Georgia Tech. What they said was, let's produce an object <coughs> which contains within it a small copy of the same object, and then a smaller copy of the object, and a smaller copy again. So this whole fern is repeated in this one branch, and this branch here, or every branch, repeats the fern again and again and again. This is a kind of complexity which appears at an intermediate scale. In fact, the mathematicians have thought some about this kind of complexity, not quite as much as uh, us or the lobster, but not quite as simple as the sterile space that uh, we uh, see in our mind's eye when we think about Maxwell's Here's an object, which is a triangle. And now I'm going to tell you a rule for making something interesting out of it. We take each one of these gray triangles and fill those gray triangles with this object again. <coughs> Here's the object. Now, with this triangle replaced by this whole thing. And now we take this gray triangle put one of these in there, and here, and there, and there, and there, and there, and there. And so we get this object. And then we do that again, and again, and again, until we make one of these objects of intermediate complexity. And here's a drawing of one of them, uh, actually made uh, here uh, at uh, the University of Minnesota, or studied here at the University of Minnesota, a tiny object. Uh, was uh, made in a, uh, a facility for uh, doing, for capturing photographic images. Here is the real thing, kindly lent to me by Professor Goldman. Goldman, so admirable, as the <laughs> person I am, touch. Okay, that's the real thing. And here is a blown up electron microscope picture of it, the whole point was to study this kind of complexity in the laboratory by producing
producing an artificial material. And that artificial material having the complexity it had. And here be the real object of that kind. And then people study, for example, the electrical resistance between two poles in that network. So there's the real world of complexity to some extent. Here is one of my friends with complicated creatures. There's a fractal that is repeated behavior here, and the face which looks like no other face in the world. Here, this is complexity. I would like to start to ask interesting questions about complexity. I asked one. My first question that I asked was, how could it be that uh, the simple laws of physics could produce complicated objects. Then I want to ask another question, which is related perhaps to the swirls of water that you saw. When you pour water out of the vase, it swirls around in a pattern which is complicated, hard to predict. How could it be that the laws of physics, which are strictly predictive in character, can lead to the complicated and hard to predict patterns that you saw. But perhaps I shouldn't tell you about the complicated and hard to predict patterns in the flow of water. You can think about other objects that are part of the physical universe. You and me, we're both parts of the physical universe, try to predict our behavior. We are hard to predict. And uh, the question is, how can we, in parts of the world, be so hard to predict if the laws of science are fundamentally predictive in character? Now, I have a whole bunch of references here, uh, which uh, strains the, which has some of the same topics that I uh, am going to be covering or have covered. The uh, James Glick wrote a beautiful book, Down the Paper of that called Chaos Making the New Science. It's correct on the science and uh, lots of fun on uh, the uh, people involved. Milton Van Dyke had published in his own basement, this is not uh, 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 the Cambridge University Press, this is his basement. He published in his own basement a beautiful book called An Album of Fluid Motion, where for 10 or 20 dollars you can see great pictures of fluid in motion. I also showed you one picture from this book, The Beauty of Fractals, showing you some of how complicated things can be absolutely gorgeous. The uh, fractal of distance, this talk uh, done for the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, the, uh, the how <coughs> fractals and those ideas got introduced into science is described in Benoit Mandelbrot's book, and these are other uh, uh, references, the virtues of which modesty forbids me to tell you about. <laughs> now, what I would really like to be able to do is take one of those hydrodynamic examples, <coughs> maybe the jet of water coming up, and explain to you how complexity arose, what that thing is all about. I just love to do that, but we do not fully have the knowledge to do that. So instead, I'm going to choose a much simpler example drawn from population biology. I'm going to describe a simple mathematical model. And by the time we're done, I hope that all of you will agree that that simple mathematical model shows chaos, shows complexity and unpredictability, and that we can understand something from it. The model is very simple. I want you to imagine an island. Every year on that island, we have a bunch of insects who lay eggs. The eggs hatch. The insects live for a month or so. They lay eggs again. The insects die off over the winter time, and the process uh, goes on again and again. So we have an annual resurgence of the insect population. And what you end up with in describing the insect is a list. The list is the population after the first year, at the start, after the first year, after the second year, the third year, the fourth year, and so forth. Now, some things seem very regular. Other things seem very irregular. For example, uh, if uh, Minnesota is like other places, the populations of 
mosquitoes year by year are very hard to predict. Some years there are lots, and some years there are a little bit. And what we want to do is talk about how the population of insects in one year produces the population in the next year. In this very simple model in which we have an isolated island and only one kind of life form, we can have a simple mathematical model. Model means simplification from which we can learn. That model is a statement of the number of insects next year depends upon the number of this year. Mathematically, let's say the number next year is a function of the number of this year. T stands for the year that we're looking at. The questions we want to ask are what kinds of patterns are possible in this list. Can the list settle down to some kind of orderly behavior? <coughs> Can it be irregular and chaotic looking? So now I have to tell you a little bit about uh, mathematical models. Now, I'm going to assume that I have a very wide variety background to this audience, and, uh, but I uh, will assume that you uh, remember a little bit from uh, your high school algebra. Maybe I've just I've got the thing that everybody has, all everybody has forgotten, namely their high school uh, algebra, but uh, okay, at least it's uniform. The first model I'm going to do is compound interest, which we can all remember how we suffered. Uh, in year zero, let's imagine we have $1,000, and here we are, times t equals zero. Imagine that the bank was giving us 8% interest, so that after a year, we would have 8% more than $1,000, or 1,000 times $1.08, or 1080 dollars The next year, you multiply, you get the same amount of <coughs> interest. You multiply the same factor, you get the same multiplication factor, so you take this 1080 and multiply it by 1.08 and get this amount, which is 1,000 times 1.08 times 1.08. And you continue on by, step by step on in the same fashion, so that year by year, the assets go up in an apparently uh, predictable fashion. Now, as mathematical models are, things have been left out. No inflation, no taxes. All of the things that make life so interesting have been left out. But the consequence of the model is that if you started out with $1,000 year by year, you, your, uh, the amount of money you would have would go up so that after 25 years, you'd have $6,400. Now, you can talk about insects in exactly the same way. You can uh, apply in precisely the same model to insect behavior, and what you say is that nt is the number of insects in year t. Use n as a general symbol for the number of insects. You say r is the population increase factor. That is, in year zero, I might start out with n sub naught insects. In year one, I might start, I might then have, according to the notion that there's an increase by a factor r in each year, I would have, might have n1 which is R times N naught insects. N naught might be 1,000 insects. The population increase factor R might be 1.08, and that might be 1,080 insects. In general, we know how to uh, handle uh, this kind of law. In the next year, we would have R times the number of insects in year one, which is R times R times the number of year zero, which is R squared times the number year zero. In the next year, you would have r cubed times the number of year, year zero. In the, in the year t, you would have r raised to the power t times the number in year zero. Now, at this point, uh, if this is the first time you uh, this, is one of this kind of thing you've a mathematical physicist like myself gets all enthusiastic, muttering things to himself like, or herself like, I've got an exact solution of this problem. That's a wonderful thing to have, because by just looking at the, the, at the formula, you can see something about the behavior. For example, if the population increase factor, R, <coughs> is bigger than one, then year by year the population goes up until the population increases, but without foul. If R is less than one, the population decreases year by year until the population goes towards zero. There are indeed two different behaviors, but this increase without bound is somewhat unrealistic, and we want to make a better model. Okay, here we go from trivia to uh, the more interesting stuff, because I'm now going to construct a mathematical model 
number next year is R times the number. And in this, in the year before, R number next year is R times the number in the preceding year. However, let's make some assumptions about overcrowding, reducing reliability of insects. Mathematically, that is a term in the population next year which depends on the number of interactions one can have between insects in this year. That number of interactions is the number of insects squared or more technically n times n minus 1 over 2, but who cares about more technically? Let's call it n squared. Okay. That number of interactions then reduces minus, the minus sign is for if B is a positive constant. That reduces the number of insects we will get in the next year. A number like R or B are called parameters in technical discussions of models like this. What that means is that they are properties of the system that does not change in time. These represent, for example, properties of the island. R might be how much vegetation naturally grows on the island. B might be a limitation produced by lack of nesting space. B is a parameter that represents the bad effects on, of overcrowding on the population. You can choose to think of that as you will. Uh, for example, it might be competition for food or nesting space. In my more kind moments, I think it's the insects aren't reproducing too well because when it gets too crowded, the fact that they're shy gets in the way. <laughs> okay, but in any case, uh, whatever I think, I want to do some fussing to get the bottom of and so I will let, I will define a new variable that I call xt, a variable something that changes in time, <laughs> parameter is something you may fix. I'll define a new variable called xt in this manner. That is the ratio of the number of insects that exist on the island to the maximum number that the island can hold. And when I do that, the model turns out to have this form, which I can then factorize and write this way. The number next year is a growth factor times the number of this year times another factor, 1 minus xt, which represents the bad effects of overcrowding. Now, we've done hard stuff. Let's see if we can get some, some consequences from it. First consequence. I want to look at the case of R between 0 and 1. This is a situation in which the natural growth will not <coughs> keep the island going with insects. The population will drop in any case. The extra factor of 1 minus x, the overcrowding, will just make the drop off occur more rapidly. The population consensus will actually go down each year. Now, I want to emphasize to you what a simple mechanical process uh, this <coughs> using a model like this is. Uh, I often do that by bringing a hand calculator and standing, punching in the numbers and saying, what you have to do if you're given a value of R and the, the value of the population, to get the population in the next year, the population ratio, you put R, which is 0.5, I'm sorry, R is 0.8, you put 0.8 there, times 0.5, times 1 minus 0.5, or 0.8, times 0.5, times 0.5, or uh, you get the number of 0.2 out. And then you go through the same thing again, using as your starting point the population in the first year. So it's 0.8, that's the R value, times the X value, 0.2, times 1 minus X, which is 0.8. And what happens then is year by year, the population goes down until, after a very long period of time, the population becomes indistinguishable from zero. Here's a picture that shows it. Here's the population ratio, the number of insects divided by the total maximum number of the island can hold, as a function of years. Sometimes I'll use T to represent the year, sometimes J. Here's J. This is the first J equals zero. The population goes down and down and down until it becomes indistinguishable.
indistinguishable from zero. And now I want to collect up my results a little bit. And in collecting up the results, what I want to do is draw a picture of, as a function of R, as described with population increase rate. I, I want to describe what happens to, the, to X in the long run. And here, R between 0 and 1, x turns out to be simply 0. The population goes down to 0. Now, everybody should be up to speed on what a model is and why models might, be, might, might represent to some extent what's interesting. What I want to do now is get into gear and start talking about more interesting situations. When R is between 1 and 3, I don't have any chaos. Still don't have any chaos. There's no chaos there. But something more interesting happened. If I started out with a small population, if the natural growth factor is between one and three, then the small population will go up and up and up in the first bunch of years until this factor of overcrowding starts to limit the growth. And eventually, we come to a situation in which the growth levels out, and we reach a fixed population. Let me show it to you here. Uh, I built the wrong thing. Well, I started out with a low population. The story was just about the same way. We started out with a population in the year minus one, which is about here. I just have the population go up, and then up, and up, and up, until it leveled out and became flat. Here for R is equal to two. In fact, without doing any very hard algebra, we can see what that flat population would be. Here's, a, here's our box. What we're saying is that after a long time, the population reaches some fixed value. Let's call that fixed value x with a star above it. And then we say in year t, the population is x star. And in year t plus 1, it is equally well x star. So the equation for the population is x star, x star here, x star there. x star is r times x star times 1 minus x star. Aha. Something else we remember uh, from our uh, high school algebra, or have forgotten from our high school algebra, quadratic equations. But fortunately, this one is real easy to solve. There are two solutions. What I'm going to ignore for a moment, x star equals 0. That's no inset. I'll factor that x star equals 0 out of the equation. And then I get what I factor. I say x star is different from 0, so I take the common factors of x star out of the equation. I'm left with the equation 1 is equal to r times 1 minus x star, or x star is 1 minus 1 minus r. This population. In this range, once again, we have a situation in which we reach a steady, non-chaotic population value. And that is population value is given by the formula 1 minus 1 over r, which I'll plot here. Put r between 1 3. Oh, there is another solution, but we as uh, experienced people know all about the other solutions. There's a solution x star equals 0. That's the solution you have uh, when you have, don't have any rabbits at all in your house. Bring two rabbits in your house, and then you know that you're going to soon have a large number of rabbits. The x star equals 0 we call unstable. It is unstable to have only a few rabbits because they breed too rapidly. And similarly, our insects do that. If we started out with a small number of insects, pretty soon we would have a large number. Now, I have here a picture which is just identical to the one I drew on the black board. It's not just drawn uh, on the piece of plastic. And I'm going to go on to the next step. I'm going to jump from r equals 3 to r equals 4. We'll come back and go back over that territory between 3 and 4 later. But I want you to see that for r equals 4, we indeed have chaos. Now let me show it to you. Here 
is the population in year T, or rather the population ratio, the number of insects on the island, divided by the number of the island in whole. I'm doing a case in which R equals 4. I happen to have chosen 0 0.77 as of my starting point as the year T equals 0. The population goes up and down, up and down with a starting point. In a way which doesn't look very easy to predict. In fact, if I show you a hundred years of insect history, and the blue dots are for the people at the very back of the room who can't see the, there are ten blue dots and there are a hundred black dots. The blue dots or the black dots or whatever produce a pattern, year by year behavior, which is very hard to predict or uh, to understand directly. But remember, there is nothing more in this complicated and chaotic appear appearing picture than our basic equation. And our basic equation is, I repeat, nothing, absolutely nothing more than x in the next year is r times x in this year times 1 minus x in this year. Complicated appearing pattern, but perfectly deterministic set of equations. An equation which you can predict the future exactly.